welcome to the latest edition of Load of Balls, and I am delighted to be starting a new segment, new series for the show. Um, Luke has, Bart has uh, been coerced into being my co-host um, for, for this series, and, and Luke, um, I suppose we were talking, and, and it's, you know, something that we believe in, that coaching is, um, you know, it's undervalued, and you know, there's not too much information there for, for particularly GA coaches out there. Yeah, I think, um, I think John, as you said, we, we had a brief conversation last week on, on things. And I think there, there's a whole, um, as we'll learn tonight from, from Sam and Stephen, there's a whole load of, um, I suppose, coaching methodologies, I think, hidden nearly in the GA. I know, I know we're kind of, we're very much like uh, teachers of old that we can like, keep everything to ourselves and, and that whole idea of, um, I suppose that whole idea of you know your own practice is your own practice, close your own door and, and don't share anything. So, um, you know, I think we share our same beliefs in that and in, in, in coaching and trying to get information out there. And as you said, we don't have that. Um, I suppose we don't have that tradition of sharing information, or you know, and particularly I think up this end of the country, I don't know what it's like down in um, you know, down in Stephen, Leinster, and things like that there. But particularly in Ulster, it seems to be very much a. Uh, closed door affairs so hopefully we can open a few doors for coaches and, and give a bit of information over the next couple of weeks brilliant and, and lads i'm obviously delighted uh steve longrigan from uh awfully minor football coach um join us and also sam Unshaw from he's a tactical periodization guru sam i think um I, I would i would call you because you know uh i was um being interviewed for the down minor job and you know, I was coming across trying to get up information on on the best practices of and best way to maybe bring on academies and out there as well. And you know, your name kept popping up in these podcasts and and uh, blogs and out there. And you know, I think we're going to be discussing that tactical periodization is the way forward. Um, maybe a hybrid. Um, Stephen, hopefully, go into a wee bit more detail with it going across to different sports, but. I think um, tactical periodization is the way forward um, at the minute, but you know it seems a bit alien. There's not too much information on it, Sam. And just can you give a layman's term of what it is for people that that maybe are hearing us for the first time? Yeah, absolutely, can. And I have to say first, uh, just you know, thanks for that very nice introduction, and thanks for having me on the uh, the new podcast. It's uh, it really is a privilege. But yeah, I mean, I mean, tactical periodization is actually a concept that, from my understanding, has been around probably since 1985, uh, 1985, sorry. And it was a chap called Victor Fraud, in, uh, or may maybe Victor Freyd, I think it might be pronounced his, uh, his name over in Portugal. Uh, but he was a professor, a professor of football and basically sort of came up with a concept. He, you know, was obviously going and analysing a lot of uh, training sessions that were happening around football during that time. And what he couldn't understand in his head is why were sessions predominantly technical focused? Why were they not focusing on the game? He, he, he tends to found quite a few sessions might be uh, working on sort of isolated practice. So it might be on a skill of passing or a skill of shooting. And he couldn't really get his head around it. So essentially what the sort of tactical periodization methodology is, is it, it talks about so in football, but also I, I would say now in, in all invasion games, really that you have five elements of the game. So you've obviously got the tactical aspect, you've got the technical aspect, you've got the physical, the psychological, the social. And then, you know, you can go even further with that when you start talking about brain development, but that's probably when it gets a bit too, you know, in depth really uh, for an introduction. But essentially the concept of tactical periodization is that everything comes from the tactical and therefore every single training session within football or within invasion games should be the tactical element. So to sort of really start here, you have to think about invasion games. Invasion games are tactics. Now, other sports such as, you know, swimming, for example, may be more technical. Uh, diving may be more technical. Uh, golf might be an element of sort of risk and reward, but quite a lot of technical aspects in as well. But in terms of invasion games, even though there is the technical aspects required to perform skills, it's not a technical game. It actually is a tactical game. And that's really where tactical periodization comes from. So 
you know, when we sort of go back to uh, Victor, you know, when he first, you know, sort of brought this out and, and the thoughts that, you know, at that particular time, what he was thinking when he was observing all these football sessions, well, to him, it was, why are you doing the, the technical separately from the tactical? Because the game isn't technical, the game is tactical. And, and that basically is what tactical periodization is really. So if we think, and you know, I'm, I'll have to apologize for the listeners, I'm a football coach, very new to uh, GAA. So you know, all the <laughs> examples will be in football. But if you think about football, te- technical, uh, tactical nature, sorry, let's think about a, a decision we want our players to do. So predominantly we're looking to score or we're looking to maintain possession in quite a simple form. So if we want the player to be able to score a goal, there has to be some tactical decision or tactical element that comes with that, which essentially is, well, how do I score that goal? So that might be uh, getting into a specific area to score with your head. It might be uh, getting into an area to score with your, uh, you know, a volley or, you know, having a shot. But that is a tactical decision. Now, with the other elements, they come in with that. So if we get, again take the example of uh, scoring, let's say he's going into uh, getting into the zone 17, which is like the uh, basically the area of where the keeper zone is. Let's say that's the tactical decision to score. Well, there is a, a technical dimension, there is a psychological dimension, there's a social a social dimension, and there is a physical dimension. So technical, I've got to be able to you know jump. You've got to be able to jump with the correct technique. I've got to be able to, to head the ball with the correct technique. Uh, psychological vision. I, I would always use the example of vision. So, or game awareness. So, you know, am I mentally aware of what's happening? You know, can I read the game? Can I get into that area? Uh, social, I use the example communication. I've got to be able to communicate to my teammate. Yeah, I want that ball coming in. Let me get my out of it. And then obviously physical. So, you know, strength, power, can I hold the opponent off the ball? And essentially what the tactical periodization uh, methodology or school of thought should we say is saying is that we need all those elements to perform that tactical decision, but it's the tactical decision we're performing. So we're not performing the uh, technical skill on its own because it's come from that tactical decision. So that's essentially in, in a nutshell what it is. Mm-hmm. Where the sort of research has kind of come, I would say it's probably sort of come into uh, awareness, should we say, in the last, last four or five years or so. You take someone like Jose Mourinho, he's actually been using this all his career. And if you uh, go back to 2004 when he took the job at Chelsea, uh, John Terry did an interview on Sky Sports and they're asking him, well, you know, what was his what was his practice like? What was so different? And he said, well, the difference was it was balls from day one. And at that time, that was probably really unheard of because uh, you think about traditional uh, football coaching sessions in England, pre-season fitness, and it'd be fitness for four or five weeks. Uh, you think about a sort of traditional coaching session, maybe fitness, you know, in terms of a warm up, then it might be a sort of isolated practice working on a technical skill. Then he's normally sort of a game at the end. And he said Mourinho was the first to actually oppose that. And that's where he goes on his, ball, uh, his points on balls from day one. He was the first to work on small sided games or, uh, you know, sort of a, a half court sort of a pitch design or sort of attack versus defense scenarios. And his sort of reasoning for this, which is quite a funny quote of, you know, well, if you think about a, a pianist, you know, playing the piano, you don't see them, you know, running around the piano for, for five minutes to prepare themselves. They're just playing the piano. So, you know, footballers, why are you, you know, passing in pairs? You need to be, you know, doing what football is, which is the tactical element. And that's probably, I think, from football and, you know, when I have conversations like this with other sports, I think it's probably... Uh, in terms of tactical sports like invasion games, that's probably a bit of a misconception of coaching. I always uh, think back to when I was sort of 14, 15 playing in a junior football team. We would always do, uh, predominantly we do like passing in pairs or maybe that one that you might have seen uh, junior classic junior football, pass, follow your pass. And then when we got into the game on the Sunday, our manager would always like expect us to be really good at maintaining possession, but we weren't. We, we were awful. We really struggled at that. And he would go mental. Well, he, he, he couldn't get his head around it. We work on passing all the time. All we ever do is pass, 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 pass. Why can't we maintain possession? But the sort of fundamental misconception there was is that he wasn't teaching us the tactical aspect to maintain possession. He was teaching us the technical aspect to pass the ball. Mm-hmm. And that's probably where the sort of traditional coaching was. The, the sort of methodology behind that is that 
we sort of isolate that skill that we need for this decision, really practice this decision. So we've got our performers that are, you know, really good at passing the ball. And then it's right, you go and perform that tactic. But as the sort of research has come in, in you know, later years, it doesn't actually work like that. You need to be practicing the decisions, the, the tactical decisions that you're going to perform in that game. You can't just be expected, if you like, to just, you know, work on this skill and then go and do it. So that's where it comes from. I, I you know, worry if I've, I've probably blabbed on a bit there, uh, chap. Oh. So uh, do let me know if I have. But uh, yeah, that, that would probably be a, an introduction, I would say, on, on tactical periodization. So just a couple of points then. You know, you, whenever I was telling people that Marino would use this and, you know, other Portuguese um, managers use it, I always say, oh, sure, Mar- Mourinho plays, doesn't play good football and blah, blah, blah. I said, this isn't this isn't a coaching philosophy. This is a methodology. You know, and I think that gets lost in trans- like translation, really, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, 100%. I think you, you're so right because that's what I often get thrown at me. Well, why are you doing that? Because he's not playing good football. You know, look at where they are in the Premier League and all that. You know, nonsense, really, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, you're right. You know, a philosophy is one thing. So a philosophy, you've got maybe your coaching philosophy or your playing philosophy. That would be the playing philosophy. How do we want to play? You know, so we're defensive, are we, are we attacking, you know, as, as those terms that are often thrown about. You've got your coaching philosophies that are, you know, my athlete focus, my coach focus, those sort of things. But but you're dead right. This is, this is a training methodology, really. So it kind of is in a separate element to that philosophy. So, you know, although you could you know say it's similar to a philosophy because it, it's scientific but it is a belief but there's the science behind it you know there's actually you know important points of why this is beneficial uh, for players you know so various reasons I could ask you if you want me to go into that do you know what I mean I mean let me know uh, <laughs> but for, for me the sort of main aspect when you think is time uh, you know when you're with players uh, you know, right through the levels, professional, semi-pro, amateur, junior, senior, you've always got a limited amount of time with those players. Professional, you're probably getting them every day or every two days if you're giving them days off. Uh, you know, amateur, I get mine once a week. Junior football, you get them once a week. So your argument really is that you are maximising the time you have with your players by using this methodology. And what that's saying is you're just working on the tactics. You're working on that decision-making element in terms of what those players are going to then go and replicate on the game. Whereas if you compare that to working on techniques, that's great. It might be helping them develop in terms of that uh, technical aspect. Or, you know, if you're doing a a physical session, great. You might be helping them get, um, you know, quicker or stronger. But my argument and the argument of tactical periodization is that doesn't actually help them on the Sunday because you miss that decision-making element. And that's where... If you probably think again, you know, I'll have to go to football again, but you think about, uh, you know, the, the great teams of Spain, for example. If you look at Spain's training methodology from that period of 2006 to 2012 13, small sided games. Barcelona, the uh, team under Pep Guardiola, small sided games was predominantly what they were doing. It was always tactical aspects, it was always based on, right, so what do we want to do in the, the adult game on the Sunday? Right, let's manipulate that in a way but we're still working on that tactical element in my opinion that's what led to the success teams over in England weren't doing that they were maybe doing quite a bit of work on physical and then when you think about if you're comparing your five sessions a week to you know your Barcelona maybe the sides in England were maybe doing one session on tactics so in terms of that decision making element you've lost so much time there so yeah methodology over philosophy there's a lot of science you know in there then you know if you do want to look a bit more into that you know these uh, articles that go into greater depth than you know i'm going on here but yeah i think i think like i said that's probably a fundamental misconception so the basic thing sam would be that you're working backwards then so you're having a way to play you're setting your team up and then you're basically using that as, a, as the first point and then you're working backwards then yeah in, in essence i mean this is this is where the sort of the element of the game model comes in, which, you know, I'll, I'll give a, a brief overview. So we, we go back to philosophy. So uh, culture is always nowadays, it's, 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 you know, lofted around in it. I know it is in football. I'm, I'm not too sure about other invasion sports, but 
what's his philosophy or what's her philosophy? So, you know, football, is it, you know, possession-based? Is it long ball? Uh, is it quick forward passing? Is it, you know, what Mourinho gets labelled, you know, defensive and, and parking the bus? But these are all ideas. And if you think about every single one of those, so, uh, you know, let's go possession-based. Well, that's normally actually just in one element of, of the game of football. So if I talk you through the uh, the mental model, as I would call it, of football, you've got four phases of the game. So you've got attack, defence, uh, two transitional phases, attacking transition and defensive transition. If we think about possession-based football, that's in that sort of attacking transition slash when you've got the ball. And that's great. You know, the players will be informed, if you like, of what to do in that particular phase of the game. But what do they do in defence then? What do they do when they've lost the ball? And it's the sort of same, you know, with all, if you think about long ball, that's all about in possession, uh, you know, quick ball forwards, target man up top, lays the ball off, short passes, try and get the ball into the box. But again, what do the team do out of possession? What do they do when they're defending? What do they do when they've just lost the ball? Uh, you know, high press, great. You know, we, we know a press is out of possession. It might also be interpreted, you know, to press the ball high up the pitch uh, when we're in possession. But again, it's kind of missing quite a lot of detail there. And that's where the game model comes in. So your game model basically demonstrates your philosophy. So if I, I take my philosophy, for example, uh, I'm a sort of massive fan of Ajax, uh, rotation of positions, uh, quick forward play, uh, all about taking risks, you know, moving the ball quickly. Those are my ideas and my philosophy. Then I have the game model that kind of goes into greater depth of what does that philosophy actually look like? So what does that look like when you're defending or what does that look like when you're attacking or you know, if we go into sort of the sub phases, what does it look like when you're counter attacking or building an attack? What does it look like when you've just lost the ball and you're going to press or, you know, when you're trying to recover your formation? That sort of goes into the greater depth of teaching our team to perform that philosophy in the entirety of the game, should we say. So again, going back to that tactical element. Then from that, that's where we can bring in the tactical periodization methodology. So if you like, we're using the, the methodology from the philosophy but our philosophy is well informed so you know if i give you an example of sort of how i would use it so uh, in my game model um, so in the phase of attack maintaining possession is the sub phase so one of the ways i want my players to maintain possession is getting into a diamond or triangle that is the you know tactical decision and action i want them or my players to make in order to maintain possession of the ball then when we sort of think about that from tactical periodization and thinking about what the actual sessions look like, well, all I do is take that, take that from my tactical, uh, sorry, my, my game model, put that into my session plan. And then the session plan is about diamonds and triangles. And every single activity I will do is tactical focused. Now, one thing that I should probably say here is that a lot of maybe, a, uh, I, don't, I don't want to say a lack of understanding, that's the wrong word, but I think a question I often get posed is, but, how are you working on the, the technical then or how are you working on the physical or the psychological or the social? Well, what tactical periodization argues is you are. Because again, if I go back to my point, you know, just a bit early on at the podcast, when I'm talking about attempting to score, attempting to score, you've got to be able to technically head the ball. You've got to be able to communicate. You've got to be able to uh, game awareness. You've got to be able to be you know, strong, powerful. But while you're performing that tactical decision and action in training, you're doing all those things at the same time. And I think that's maybe where people don't realise that you don't actually have to isolate these elements because mm -hmm. it's happening all the time. Now, of course, we could say that might be a bit naive. One thing I would tend to do just to aid that development, I might uh, add in like one or two to each passing. So we're still working on the tactical element, but we're putting a bit of a push on that technical element as well because we're, we're forcing the players to pass a bit more. But in terms of the point I'm, I'm trying to make, yeah, you're right. So it, it comes from the philosophy Originally, so what's my idea? How do I want to play? That's great. That's sort of stage one, if you like. Stage two, well, what does that look like? And sort of every single aspect of the game. And then stage three is great. So I know what, uh, I know how what my uh, players to attack the goal. That's my training session. But everything I do in that training session is based on that tactical principle, if you like, from that game model. And then that's where everything sort of stems through. Yeah. Now, Stephen, uh, I suppose whenever Sam's talking there, you're, you're thinking about the, uh our own sport and and you know and, and the way he's talking there it makes sense to me that you know one to have a game model 
uh, break it down, and then you know that's the way to to coach. Yeah, that was excellent from Sam. A really detailed um, account of it. Um, yeah, so with the where I see it in the GA particularly is that like we've gone very game game based is the kind of lingo at the minute, and everyone's gone game based, and everything has to be a game. And that's fine. But I think what tactical periodization will do for the GA community now is add another layer to that and um, give us a bit more structure in your in your, your sessions and your planning for your sessions. So as Sam was saying, the first thing you need to do is you need to establish your game model, how how you want to, um, as Sam said, how, how you want your team to play, etc. And uh, uh, Luke, you had um, a game model up there in on Twitter there recently. Uh, so people can kind of see that. And once you have that, then you take one of the kind of principles and you run your session from that principle. Whereas GA coaches at the minute, I think there's a lot of kind of go on the Twitter feed or buy a book and see, here's a nice game. This looks good. I'll do a warm up. I'll throw this into the session. Uh, here's another look game I see on Twitter. I'll throw that one in there too and cool down and that's it. You know, we got good intensity in the session and, you know, great session. But um, players expect more. And as Sam said, we now, players need to know the why, why you're doing that that game. And that's where the tactical periodization is. Uh, when you, you start off with your game model and in that session, maybe tonight, you will focus in on um, maybe the transition to defense um, moment. Okay. So your whole session will be based around that moment. And within that, then you pick one of the principles. So the principles, one of the principles could be in the first moment when you get turned over that you immediately press the ball. And maybe if you're playing a high press, you, you shut down the, um, the passing lanes or the, 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 the receivers. And then you, 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 you can build that into your session then and you pick a game that suits that principle um, and maybe a second game or whatever um, and then you build it in. So that's that's how you do it. Um, and I think it just gives a, a, a bit more focus to the session. It gives the why you're doing it in the session. And then at the end of the session, you check uh, for understanding, do the players know that this is what we want to see now at the weekend when we're playing our match? Uh, exactly that. Um, so that's, that's where... I see the biggest learning for the GA at the moment in terms of uh, adding tactical periodization to. No, that's, that's, that's brilliant, Stephen. Look, I suppose the, uh, you know, whenever, whenever you're thinking about it and that, it's about giving players empowerment as well, isn't it? You know, you're, you're sort of, it's, it's, it's about giving them the, the tools then to go out the field and, you know, you have practice making the right decisions nearly. Yeah. That, like, this is a complex, a very, very complex um, methodology that uh, Victor Frada with um, a lot of kind of disciples or whatever you want to call them who've worked under him and that um, have come up with using scientific research. You know, this isn't thing, one thing that they've just plucked out of the, the sky <laughs> one day and decided that this is, you know, a method. This is huge. They've looked at complex theory. They've looked at, you know, how we learn skills like you know there's two mm -hmm. ways you learn skills one is kind of that linear development and one is the kind of the big one now is the ecological kind of dynamic theory that you put people in the environment and they learn through the environment um and that's exactly what tactical periodization does you're learning through the environment of and you're learning through the environment of the game and um you know your your players will learn by seeing the situations that occur in a game rather than doing a passing drill that doesn't resemble anything like a game or <laughs> happens in a game. So, you know, that's, um, that's, that's the big thing I see. Like, what about you? Do you, do you like, is it, is it, uh, like the, this, like learning part of it? Yeah. Um, just want to say, Sam, an unbelievable, um, kind of a, back to what tactical periodization is because you kind of give it one want to understand these things and sometimes when you use a uh, when you use a phrase like tactical periodization it nearly goes over their head nearly very quickly 
Um, so like the fact that we can we can bring it down and just what you said, Stephen, as well. Like if we look at Gaelic games, for example, at the minute, you know, it's uh, and as you said, Sam, like invasion sports are quite similar. Now the only one thing that I would suggest is that if we look at say, uh, you know, you know, Jose Mourinho and Brendan Rodgers in the Premier League are you know big components opponents of at your prioritization. If we look at rugby, for example, um, I know England rugby and Eddie Jones is a big proponent of at your prioritization as well. The moments in rugby and soccer are a little bit, um, they're a little bit more structured, I think, than Gaelic games. Like we have a lot of moments where um, there's a lot of unknown or uncertainty, and that that's the biggest one that I think, John and uh, Stephen. I don't know if you agree or not, but we have to prepare players to think on the pitch themselves as well. And it's just like by doing isolated drills and things like that, they're, they're not learning that decision-making element of it. Um, so just as you said, Stephen, if, if, I've, if my session, for example, if my session might be um, um, on maybe um, uh, keeping possession or possession-based training for just as an example, it could be early on in the season and you're looking to keep possession because you notice that we're getting a lot of turnovers or just as an example, you know, we can still bring sub elements into, into the games as well. So if I'm playing a small side of game, it might have, you know, your principal, you might be introducing your principle of defending as well. So for example, if we lost the ball, you know, you're, as you said, your first thing might be to press the ball. But if we say deny, as an example, that even though we're working on a principle of possession for the session, we can still incorporate small different principles of like our defending and our attacking kind of element of that there as well. And that's all down to decision making, in my opinion. And Sam, how would a, a, a typical session look for you within the season? Like, how would a how would a preseason session in in soccer or football look for you? Um, and then I'll probably come to you and ask ask the same question. Um, you know, traditionally in Gaelic games, you've got an eight week running block that usually starts in around Christmas, January time, uh, around the local parks or or up the mountains. So this will be totally new to, to a lot of coaches as well. Yeah, uh, re really great question. And I, th I think, you know, Stephen kind of touched on the point, really. Um, you know, this methodology is sort of ingrained in, in concepts like nonlinear pedagogy, for example. And key word there is representativeness or representative practice. You know, when you are using this tactical periodization methodology, the key element for me and sort of my understanding here is that it has to represent some form of the, the adult game, I would say. So the game on the Sunday, the training session has to represent that. So, you know, so I, I can give you an example of sort of, you know, what we did sort of pre-season. Um, we do a lot of small-sided games. We might do sort of one versus two situations, two versus one situations. Uh, we might do five versus four. Our sessions would always represent an element of the game, whether that be, you know, attacking play, defensive play, um, you know, transitional play. But again, we just sort of work on one of those elements from that game model. So, you know, I go back again to, uh, you know, possession. Uh, so a, another, uh, you know, principle of my game model is all about one and two touch play. Now, what we might do at the start of the season is, is do that one one and two touch play because if you think about the physical demands that's very physically demanded that's requiring quite a lot from the player so it's almost representing a sort of you know pre-season fitness drill they're doing shuttle runs or, or you know whatever traditionally you would have done so I might put that one in pre-season because I know that's maybe demanding a bit more there mm -hmm. the difference is that we're still representing the game and even though that's physically demanding all the time doing that active decision-making process. So always making decisions within that 5, 10, 15-minute practice. And I think that's probably a key message, really, is that, I mean, one thing I'll say that there's no sort of right or wrong here, because when we're saying, you know, representing the game, that can represent the game in terms of, you know, 11 versus 11, you know, but equally it could be a one versus one, because, you know, an important thing of representativeness is, is that situation going to happen in the game in the Sunday and that sort of comes in with uh, I think probably Stephen was, was just about to go on to uh, so per perceptual movement couplings uh, I believe the term is uh, so you know are you perceiving what you're going to perceive in the Sunday you know they might not be exactly the same decisions and actions but you know we've seen this similar strategy before so we can predict the outcome 
that's a really important part of, of you know the sort of uh, decision making process but yeah i mean i mean for me uh you know we take a session from that game although i personally always start with uh, attack probably maintaining possession because again for me that's that's really physically demanding um but you know we can also exaggerate different elements like i said before so you know if we're wanting to really work on players fitness we can add in little constraints or rules that, that try and promote that. So like I said, you know, one touch passing, pass and move all the time. We're forcing players to do that. That's really heavy on the sort of physical element. Uh, likewise, if we got midway through the season and, you know, we see that our players are really struggling to communicate, we might add in certain rules, constraints that are promoting that communication. So that might be, you know, a, a, a very simple one of, okay, only one player can communicate in this session. So how are you maximising that time? The game's a tactical game. So, you know, we've got to be doing tactical decision-making practice, haven't we? No, definitely. And Stephen, I think the, the big thing that people will be pushed against is, is the physical part of it. Um, you know, I really do think that that's, that will be a stumbling block for, for coaches to say, how can we get, you know, it's just so traditionally ingrained in, in GA now, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, we're obsessed with the physical and, you know, I went through that cycle too um, and you look at some webinars at the minute and you see, you know, it's literally GA 15 moves uh, onto maybe a small bit of technical work, then it's back to a block of MAS work and then it's 10 minutes tactical work and a, and a traditional cool down. So if you break all that down, you have 10 minutes maybe of tactical work in a whole session. In a week, that would go into maybe, if you did two sessions and then a match, there's 20 minutes of actual tactical work or, you know, game game specific training in a whole week. So as Sam said, it's about maximizing the time you have with your players. And at the end of the day, you, your aim is to train people to become better at winning games. And I don't think that model does that. So um, how you, how you um, plan your week a professional soccer player he's he's a week laid out for seven days okay with the ga uh we have three days we have uh, down here south we we kind of it's like tuesday friday sunday i know you kind of um your club is is monday, monday wednesday, wednesday friday mm -hmm. yeah so but the, the way i've kind of i've gone with kind of fergus Connolly's model um there's a few models out there and the best one, I think, is this one. Now, you'd have to tweak it a little bit for a year because that, that Wednesday to Friday, if you're playing a game on uh, Friday, it, it's a little bit tight. Mm -hmm. So on, the, on the, the Tuesday night, you do a high-intensity session. So how you get intensity in your, in your small side of games, you're looking for um, a lot of maybe if, if physical if the people who are strength and condition coaches be looking for acceleration, decelerations, um, that kind of thing. So you'd be doing a lot of 1v1s, 2v2s, 3v3s, small pitches. You get huge intensity in that, as you know. Um, so that you go for a high intensity on that day. And, you know, you'd be basing it around maybe your sub or sub sub principle of that. So on the, on the Thursday night or the Friday night, then you'd be looking for high volume. So how you do the high volume then is you uh, if you're a strength and conditioning coach you're looking for that high speed running, so you make bigger pitches, mm -hmm. so you play using maybe uh, three quarter side running there, um, then of course then on uh, now between high intensity and then maybe the following week what high volume, and then the Wednesday night because you're so close to the game you'd be looking at uh, you know speed the uh, Victor Freda calls it speed of reaction so it'd be kind of it'd be kind of backs and forwards. But, so Sunday is just your game day, you know. Um, you'll always try and have your game, have a game on the Sunday, and bring in what you did on the the the, the Tuesday and Thursday or Tuesday and Friday night and implement it in your game. Um, um so um, you can break down your game to you know fifteen minutes, ten minutes, seven minutes, or whatever way you want to do that. But uh, um, that that's that's how I um. I believe is the be best way of, of implementing it. Um, there is, I know uh, Shane Mangan has proposed a model there too, which is, is worth a look. And, and uh, but as I say, the one I think, Fergus Connolly's one, I think is, is very, very good. And I suppose as coaches, um, look, you know, it, it allows us to 
manipulate it and, and use a hybrid form as well for our own beliefs out there as well. So it's it's good that you know there's it's not set in stone. This is the way to do it. A hundred percent, John again, Stephen, you know, touched on it as well there, and an interesting point. Um, I actually had an interesting conversation with a coach recently, and you know the the, the you know the I would be very much of a proponent of um, at the start of the week too high intensity work, particularly me. Um, we would have trained Monday, Wednesday for a game uh, game day on maybe Saturday, for example. So we would have done a similar model to that, um, but. For example, 1v1s, if you have four groups of 1v1, that is still a game-based model because you're still implementing a moment in a game that's happening, you know, and it's interesting because the same coach actually proposed that if you look at Gaelic games, for example, like one of my principles is if I'm playing in a, in a, in a, when I'm attacking, one of my principles or one of my themes that I, I work on is we try to get into 1v1, 2v2 situations, and uh, ideally 2v1 or 3v2, or, or an overload, you know, for example, and um, particularly if you're playing against maybe a, a team that's, you know, playing with 14 or 15 men behind the ball. So if you're, if that's in your game model, and you've pulled that, so that's pulled from my game model into my training session as well, the players are used to working in a 1v1 or 2v1, that they know that that's what they're getting into. And then, as you said as well, so, you know, a session on a Tuesday night may look like, you know, 1v1, 2v2, into 5v5, 7v7, you know, that kind of stuff. And um, working on your on your base in your um whatever principles you're deciding for that night, and as you said then, Stephen, you on your on the Thursday night, then you're working maybe more on larger pitches and working on you know various different elements, and it could be you know as you said, it could be um transition and make that transition from defence to attack. So you could have um you know you could have a, a small set of game going on one side of the pitch, and then you know you blow the whistle and you're looking for a transition then from the, uh from one team. Uh, one team's transitioning from attack to defence, mm -hmm. and the other team is, is transitioning from defence to attack. So you're working on your own as well. That's all game model stuff. Um, and again, what I like about, you know, as I said, Stephen, I would be a big proponent of Fergus Connolly's as well. You know, he makes it um, he makes it very accessible for Gaelic, you know, for GA coaches to look at that because, you know, the majority of coaches will play in twice a week and then they'll play at the weekend, and that'll be about maximising their time. The only other interesting one about Shane Mangans is, and it's something I've been looking at myself, is it's very, very interesting. Shane Mangans' model on, you know, implements the contest as well. You know, um, I can't remember the percentage off the top of my head, but in Gaelic games, the kick out, for example, is one of the most important elements as well. So that would be, you know, one of the elements that we would look at as well. But you could probably incorporate the kick out into transition, if you think about it, because mm -hmm. if we're trying to transition the ball from A to B, from a kick out, you know, we can incorporate the kick out as part of our transition, you know, under our transition principle or whatever case may be. Um, but no, I would be, it's very accessible. And again, as you said, even you're bringing all this, the, the things that you're going to see in the game on Sunday into your training during the week. And Sam, what, what way would, um, how long would you to say on that sub principle, how long would you spend on that? So say you're you're looking for defense to uh, transition from defense to attack. Say, is it that week is the element that is is what's going to be trained that week, or is it for two weeks or so on? So going back on the elements of game models, uh, one professor at the Leeds Becker, I think she's with Leeds Becker. You, you know, don't don't quote me on that. But uh, uh, a researcher called Pam Richards, she talks about. Uh, sort of mental models of sport, uh, performance models, which is, you know, sort of the uh, the university academic term for a game model. And she talks about uh, alpha models and beta models. So your alpha model is like your target performance, where you're eventually going to get to, but you might have one beta model or two beta models that are a sort of lesser form or contextualized game model, if you like, at an earlier time. So, uh, you know, if I sort of give you an example, sort of going through... Uh, you know, sort of academy, football academy, for example, under 12, you might have the decision to uh, find and create space. Then when you sort of come back to that decision at under 14s, it might be okay. So now can we find space in between the lines? Then when it gets to under 16s or maybe under 18s, then it's, can we find and create space in between the lines? Can we play the ball through the lines? So in essence, it's sort of the same decision, but it's sort of progressed every single time. So that would be a, uh, uh, chat called Bruner 1960 I think it was uh, spiral curriculum so his sort of methodology is that you would uh, work on one principle and you might do one or two sessions within that week 
then you don't work on that again for maybe three months. Then when you come back to that, it's a, a higher level. So you're not learning exactly the same thing. You're challenging your participants or your athletes and you're getting them to engage more in the thinking process. Okay, so we taught you that last time. Now we're just expanding that decision a bit more. So that would be one way of doing it. Uh, personally, how I use it is I sort of go through the game model through you know the various stages. So for me, uh, I, I, you know, I couldn't really tell you why, but for me, I always felt attacking principles were the hardest to teach the players. So, you know, when I sort of really started using this this year with the team I was at just before Rookley Town now, we went through every single principle and we'd only do one session. And the sort of methodology behind that, again, was I don't want to spend four sessions doing that because if I spend a month doing that, the next time we're going to get onto that principle is probably going to be a year's, you know, down the line a year later. <laughs> By that time, the players have forgot it. And, uh, you know, again, going back to the time element, players, when you think about learning, they maybe pick up a couple of things in a session. They'll never pick up fully what that principle is. Uh, if you have the mindset that learning is, uh, you know, I think the word is cumulative. I might have completely uh, pronounced that wrong. But uh, the, the sort of element there is that, you know, we're providing this practice we're allowing players to explore and, you know, learn this decision, decision for themselves, not necessarily putting a, a target for how much information we want to give them. I think it's context specific. I think it's also, you know, sort of different ages and stages, you know, where your players at, if they're, you know, right at the top of professional elite level, you know, we're expecting that they'd probably be making these, you know, macro decisions, if you like, for years and years and years and years. And all you're doing is you're, narrowing down a bit more specifically so you know a bit more specifically how do we want to maintain possession there so that would be you know mindset insight i should say of you know how i've used it and, and some advice really there yeah Stephen, what, what way would you um interpret it for how long you spend on each subsection and and you know um how long would you give it each, each principle as well yeah like um i'd always build from the defense anyway um and set set up uh you know your defensive structure first um but you know i i think um like the game model is, as i said luke has one there um nicholas walsh has uh, put up a really good one there recently um on uh, on a webinar he did very simple and then you can start to build out out from that and you know then have your sub principles and then you can go sub sub principles and you can go uh, very very complicated but build from your your your, your simple principles um maybe four principles for each moment once they have that solid foundation of each principle then you start to build build out from that but um yeah it's it's just it's it's a complicated well it's a, it's a tough process just going through it first and, and actually sitting down and deciding how you actually want your team to play it because um you know a lot of coaches get confused with actually how they want to play do you know and and uh, and uh, once, if you don't have your game model concrete, well, how are your players going to have it concrete? So um, sit down first, get that right, and then take one principle a night, I think, is enough, and, and build from there. Well, look, Donny Gall have a pretty simple game plan. It's usually get as many men behind the ball and then run with it, isn't it? But uh, how long would you um, stay on each principle and, you know, what's your thinking behind it? Um, I suppose my biggest, I suppose my biggest um, critique, uh, if you were, of, of um, you know, some elements of tactical periodization, like in some research, and Sam, you might correct me on this, but on a research paper I, wrote, I read recently on it, you know, it suggests if you're not going to do it in a game, don't do it in training, right? So, for example, if I'm, if I'm, if Jose Mourinho, for example, if he takes a soccer if he's considered a defensive coach, right, or even if we look at, say, if we look at Jim McGuinness as an example, and his philosophy is, you know, largely based on attacking football, and he wants to move the ball through the lines, and he wants to, so, you know, put players in various positions. So, for example, if I'm using my, at the moment, is defending, and I'm breaking it, I break it down to, right, when we're defending in shape versus getting the ball back as part of mine, you know, um, trying to, if we're, say, for example, if we're attacking, if we're attacking against an orthodox 6 v 6, or if we're attacking against 14 men behind the ball, just, create different scenarios in that regard um, and work on them and I don't think there's anything wrong with repetition either you know repetition of 
um, the same, the you know, doing the same thing because again, as as, as the men pointed out, you know, you, you want to ingrain this in these players. And as as I said, so say for example, if my if my moment if my moment for the night or my that I'm working on principle of um, attacking against blank and defence, for example, I'm still coaching my defenders as well throughout that session. You know, I'm still they're still using the principles of my defending, while my attackers are using the principles of attacking and vice versa as well. So repetition. So like I would be probably um, somebody who maybe mixes things up a little bit. Um, that's the model that I use because so. Um, I remember having a good conversation with a friend of mine, Paul Fisher, and he said, you know, you want to put players into positions they're going to see on Sunday as much as you possibly can throughout the week. So, you know, that's just what I would look at. And is that like the same, like the same activities and the same games set up and up there? Is that what you mean by repetition or is it coming up with different, um, it's different uh, ideas, but the same scenario? No, 100%. And it's funny because uh, on a webinar last year, I remember a podcast I heard um, in that piece saying that the most difficult thing for coaches is doing the same thing differently. So, you know, you're always trying to come up with, you're always trying to come up with different games. But, you know, if, you know, if, if you're, you know, whatever your principles, whatever you're, you know, you're looking at the moment, your principle and your sub principles, they're largely not going to change, but you just have to have a bit of imagination on how to, like for example, if we take the very basic thing and, and say, uh, you know, like games. If we're using, uh, if we're doing, um, if we're working on say, uh, transition from attack to defense. Like the you know the game, uh, the three the three teams. You know, one team in the middle and they're attacking over and back. You know, and you've got defenders attack. You've got once they're turned over, they're attacking and that kind of. Thing. You can do variations of that game. You're still doing the same thing. You're still incorporating the same principles, but you're doing it differently. Um, and variation mm-hmm. as well. But then if there's something that works for you, like if, if you know, if, if you feel that you get a lot of benefit out of that, I don't think there's any issue in repeating that same game as well if you get the, the benefit of it, like, you know. No, it's true. Sam, I suppose um, the best way to critique the, the, the methodology and that is, is about your players then. How has, like, have you got experienced players that have had previous uh, regimes, you know, and how have they found it? I mean, uh, the, the the funny thing really for me was, uh, you know, I'd learned this for probably two years, but never really had a, a team at sort of where I felt I could, you know, implement this because I was working for, you know, sort of football academies and they'd have a certain way of how they wanted to coach. And it was never this, it was always that sort of traditional approach. They're used to working on solely a technical aspect pretty much through that session. And then you get to the end and to do the game. So, you know, when I'm rocking up to the first couple of sessions at, uh, you know, the, the, the club I was at before the one I'm currently at, uh, it was challenging because there were so many questions there. Why are we doing this? You know, what are we doing in small sided games? Don't we need to work on passing? And the biggest challenge I found was getting players to actually buy into it. And the approach we took to that was, well, let's try and explain it to them. Because for me, you know, a big way really, you know, if you don't understand how this is beneficial to your game, you're not going to buy into it. Because we got the team play, turning up and, and they loved it because they'd understood what it was. Uh, but, you know, that was, a, that was a context where it was deeply ingrained culture. Uh, you know, we Oakley Town now, you know, younger age group, you know, they, they love it. They, for them, it's the best training they've ever done. Why? Because they're just playing football. All right, it's not always 11 aside, but it's, you know, as we said, five versus four, three versus two, always playing the game. They absolutely love it, you know, and you can see the improvement. And I think the big thing is that once the players see that improvement, feel that improvement, feel that, wow, you know, this is the fittest I've ever been or, you know, I've never been so, uh, you know, excellent at just making these decisions, you know, I've, I've never communicated as much on this pitch. That's when they begin to buy into it and go, actually, you know, this kid who studies a master's does know what he's done about rather than, you know, our, our old grassroots coach who's been, we, uh, we dog and stick on side of the pitch for the last five years. But, you know, for me, it's about trying to, you know, explain this. And I think, you know, a, a message I always say to the coaches is don't use the academic language, you know, try and say it in as simple forms as possible. Uh, but just persist with it. You know, you will get players turn around, you know, if you work in a youth context, you will get parents turn around and say, what's this? This isn't what I'm paying you for. I've had that, but over time they begin to see. Ah, okay, I like this. I understand what it is now, and I think that's you know persistence. 
you know, we know why we're doing it. You know, we've read why we, we believe in it. And you've just got to stick to your principles, really. Yeah, no. And Stephen, what about yourself? Have, you know, whenever players have sort of questioned you, have you sort of questioned this as well? And, and maybe, you know, wavered from it a wee bit? Or are you, do you see the benefits of this 100%? Yeah, like it, it, it's a big change from maybe what um, other coaches maybe have seen or other managers or what uh, I work with minors. So a lot of these lads are just sponges to whatever you throw out with them, you know. Um, so they're not too bad. But uh, I, I, I even listened to Pep Guardiola one day and he was saying that in Bayern Munich, he, he's more or less tactical uh, periodization, but he was saying that, you know, four or five of the players every session be coming to him saying, we need to do more running gaffer, you know, we need to, we need to do the, and he was explaining to him, no, you don't, This it's all in the game and showing them the GPS data, but they still weren't convinced the likes of Robin and them and, and they used to run in um, after the session on their own. Um, the, you know, so you will get some players who just want, who need that kind of, that running that's fair enough, but uh, you explain the why you can back it up with your GPS if you have GPS because you know the data will will appear the same. Um, but uh, you know, there's a great paper there by Jason McGatton, the uh, strength and conditioning coach with Kerry, and um, it showed two things one, in the, he did the study on division three and division one um football teams in Ireland, inter county. And Division Three teams ran more than Division One teams, and uh, so that just proves that it's not the fittest team that wins the game. And the other thing then is that he did uh, he done a few studies on the games, and it showed that the fittest team didn't act, or the team that ran the most didn't actually win the game all the time. So um, it's not about running all the time; it's about how efficient you become at your running and that's why as you go through a season um you you make better decisions so you don't have to run as as much and you know that's proven across sports that's proven in soccer etc that it's not the team that runs the most it's the team that is efficient with the running and and best at their decision making it's the team with the best at their decision making will win the game so that's that's how you back it up yeah, well, we've seen that with 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 Dublin, Sam. I'm not, I'm not too sure. I sent you a couple of, of games there with with Dublin in it, and like, look, the big thing that I was talking to people is that Dublin seem to be making the right decisions at the right time. They their game management and everything seems to be superb, and that's where they seem to have uh, the edge over teams. Now th- there is talk of the the, the physical not there, but surely everyone. Physically, it's not. It's going to be at inter county level, mostly five percent difference. Yeah, well, if we look at inter county football at the minute, like the top, there's no real doubt. Like every every coach, every manager in in the in the country will have an S and C coach, mm-hmm. and they're all predominantly quite good. Like, but I'll just like as an example, like to me, one of the best S and C coaches in the country is the is Paul Fisher, who used to he was the former Donegal senior inter county um, coach. And his, he worked with the coach, the two coaches um, in Donegal time and time again. And he would, it's all about game. So like he would even say, like they would be working on, this is what we're working on tonight in game based stuff. And like he would, he would be able to say, he would be able to work out the GPS units from that there. They did no, like, um, you know, very little um, conditioning away from the game. Like Dun- Dublin were the same, you know, by all accounts. If we look at the Fergus Colney model, they didn't do much away from the game. But you're, if you look at even, uh, like, so Dublin for me are the best at the basics of Gaelic football. Um, the All Blacks are the best at the basics of rugby and my limited knowledge of rugby. They don't make basic mistakes. You don't learn basic mistakes by running around the pitch. You know, you don't, mm-hmm. you don't learn basic skills by, you know, you do it in game scenarios and game situations, incorporating your principles of, of the game that you're working on. So if, like, like if, as an example, you know, just off the top of my head, like, um, you know, I worked with a team last year and I play, I was doing game-based stuff um, with them, you know, and so they, we were working on possession, retention um, and transition one night. We did four games, four games, um, various uh, various elements of the game, various, you know, set pitch size and what, what whatever you want to, but, you know, one, and it was an hour and 40 minutes, 
session and one player, you know, from GPS stats, 13.5 kilometers. Now that's outrageous from a, from a footballer, probably too much if we had in a lifetime. But my point is, you know, he's covering the distance being covered or whatever the case may be. He's building his fitness through the game. And that's, that's what we need to incorporate as much as we can. And I think there is a shift, Stephen, I think in Gaelic games. And, and I'm hoping that, you know, coaching through the game is as much like, I remember being at a, at a conference with Paddy Talley years ago and it was all about Gaelic games. It was about 50 minute, 60 minute sessions of like, serious high intensity. Um, I know that, you know, the, the new manager in Wicklow, uh, Davy Burke, is a massive proponent of it as well and all game-based stuff. And the coaching, the, the, the players, the feedback from the players and, and these coaches is, you know, it's phenomenal. Like if we take even in, in Derry, Rory Gallagher is renowned. I'd done several sessions, like he coached several sessions I was involved in and we did nothing without the ball. Everything was with the ball, all in game-based scenario. And there is a, they are intense, they are as intense a session as you'll do. So if you believe in it and you, you know, as, as the boys say, if you explain your why and, you know, you get buy-in from them and they, there's enjoyment and that, you know, that'll de- develop as well then. And they see the benefits of Sam's says, This isn't an overnight thing, but neither is any team. You know what I mean? Players don't get fit in, in a week and a half as well. So I suppose we have to, mm-hmm. you know, if you have your beliefs and you have your philosophy, um, and you use this methodology, you have to stick by your principles and I suppose the pro- like that dreaded word, the process, but it is, like I heard a great um, phrase the last day in a book that I'm reading, focus on the root, not the fruit. Um, so if you focus on, if you have a healthy root, you'll get plenty of fruit. So I suppose we have to just keep, you know, keep um, sticking to your beliefs in the game and, and we'll, yes. we'll, you know, we'll benefit from it. Stephen, um, uh, with, uh, you know, I was just thinking there, about the change in the perceptions of of um, you know the the methodology and that you've mentioned Fergus Connolly was he involved with the Dublin team and when did he come up with this structure and how did you find out about it? Yeah, so um, he uh, I I think he was kind of advisor to Jim Gavin. Um, uh, he yeah he's produced a lot of books there. He's from Scotstown. Um, Monon, isn't it? Scott's on Monon, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, and he uh, he's worked with a lot of professional teams. Uh, he spoke to Victor Freda. He he interviewed him, um, and all of the teams he he's worked with. He's he's deemed this as the best methodology, um, and he then produced his um, kind of video series on this methodology and. Um, it's it, 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 he has a couple of books out there, and you know, um, game this, changer, I think, Stephen, what about what was that? Game changer, I think it's one of them, yeah, called. game changer. And he's two, uh, two called the process, uh, process one and process two, they add to it, and um, all, all the stuff on his website, the videos are on his website, so. Um, that's where well, I there's there's some great books out there. There's um that tactical periodization one, I think, is the best one. Uh, a proven successful training model by Bordeno and Villanueva. Um, I think that's the best one. Um, I know Eddie Jones, he went to Villanova to find out about the tactical periodization, and that's where he learned it. Um, so I, if you're to read about it, that will be the book I'd, I'd go after. Uh, and if for GA, go, go at Fergus Connolly stuff. Um, I think it's it's it gives you a really good way of implementing it. Um, or or get us three down, Stephen, to to the club, and and we'll, <laughs> we'll yeah, as, good, as good as anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, what? If you're, uh, go ahead, look. If you're looking at like if you're looking at Fergus Connolly, um, you know, for GA coaches out there, what what what's I I think uh, Stephen, I hope you think the same. But, he broke it down in a very simple manner. Like when you're looking at this and what he's explaining, and he was an advisor to Dublin, like there's no, there's absolutely no secret behind it whatsoever. And like if you look at, say, for example, the Dublin kickout, for example, people think there's a hundred different systems going on at constantly one time. There's not, their main principle is probably movement and creating space and leaving space and vacating space. So that's what they do until the kickout option's there. You know, if we break that down, it's so simple. So that's what I like. I would definitely encourage if you get a chance now. I know that the website, the um, 
it, it is there is a price on it, but it's it's breaks it down so simply. It, it, you know, in terms of layman's terms for, for GA coaches out there, you can implement this or certainly elements of this in, in, in any team that you're working with. No, it's very <laughs> Guys, I don't want to keep this much longer, but um, you know we have went over a, a whole stream of information. I'm sure the listeners and, and viewers will be um, <laughs> needing a break after this as well. But Sam, are you? Uh, have you changed anything with the methodology at all that you think suits you personally better, or like you know, uh, or your team better? Yeah, I mean, the, the main thing for me was, and when I first um, started looking into this, I, I, I had a lot, uh, I, I, sorry, a lot of research into uh, Bordono's uh, work. And the, the key thing I read was, it, it was all about, you know, everything will come through. Everything will come through. Uh, where I would probably personally argue that would be, maybe that is maybe a bit too naive from us as coaches simply because we know that every player we have isn't the same, you know, take football because that's my sport. We know that defenders, different physical traits to attackers, attackers, different, different, different physical traits to midfielders, different physical traits to goalkeepers. So for me, I think what I do a bit differently that probably isn't sort of in the books that would give you a, you know, a, a, an overview of how to incorporate this concept is just adding in constraints when I feel necessary so, you know, do I feel that this is physically demanding enough, knowing that we're in that sort of pre-season uh, pre stage? Like no. GPS? So like GPS? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let, let's add in a little, you know, rule there. Now, tactical periodization, you know, from when I read it, would probably say, no, you should be patient because it will come. Uh, but, you know, again, context, that might work for some. Mm. It hasn't worked for me so far in the amateur game. So that's a little something I've had to change. But you know, I, I, that that would just be my advice, really. You know, what's what's your context where you're working in? You know, some instances are sort of more results driven, some are more performance based. If you've got that time, and your focus is about developing players, you know, maybe you can allow the traditional way of using it. For me, you know, we have to win. <laughs> we have to win on a Sunday, boys. I'm out of a job. We're we're so, we, we don't get time. Well, we don't get time. <laughs> <laughs> Every so week. That, 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 that's where our sports align then. Uh, but yeah, you know, for me, just, you know, is, is it being naive? Someone, so a, a lot of people would, you know, completely disagree with me there. But for me, I that's that's just a little tweak I make to the methodology. It works for me, works for my team, uh, you know, giving us success so far. So, you know, and, and that would always be something I would... So I, I mean, I do a lot of come and come on quite a few podcasts. I always say to people, don't ever take everything at face value. Yeah. You know, brilliant concept. You know, I'm a massive admirer of it. But if you need to tweak it, that's okay as well because it's got to be right for your context and who you're working with. Mm -hmm. You know, because of course, different challenges for different contexts in there. Definitely, Stephen. What about yourself? How were you introduced to it? And you know, are you? Um, how do you plan the future then with with it moving moving forward? Yeah, as Sam said, Derry, you know, you don't have to be a slave to the methodology either. Um, and, you know, um, because the way the environment works in, in, in Ireland, we have to be adaptable. Some days the pitch is unplayable and you might have to do, you might have to do running. You might have to do straight line running or you might, um, you know, so we, we, I believe it's the best methodology out there. That's my belief. Um other people will believe other things, but I think there's a huge amount you can take from it um, and you can adapt, you know, you can add in some other stuff from different methodologies if needs be, or, um, you know, if you have strong beliefs in that area, whatever. Um, but going forward for me, I believe it's the best one. It's uh, at this moment in time and, and uh, it's the one I, I, I'm, I'm learning more and more about it and, and getting better at it, implementing it and trying to kind of, um, uh, with with the the manager and the, the coaches with me to teach them about it too and bring them on board into this methodology. So that's that's where we're at. Stephen, it's, it's not a like how you know. I suppose it's it's about picking the right manager to work with as well because obviously you know um, as a coach you're told to get this to get this team up to a certain level or work on this. So you know, is it going to be management coach? 
um, sort of scenario that that you think will, will have to be, or do you think that you know you can you can talk your way around a, a good manager <laughs> into thinking this way as well? Um, yeah, listen, sure. I, I only, you know, I, I learned it, and and you just have to teach the um, the manager, or you know, give them the resources to learn it. Um, you know, put them on the track to Fergus Connolly stuff, or whatever, or whatever, <laughs> whatever way you want to do it. But um, um, give them Sam's number. Yeah, no, but and then you know, once you do a few sessions, uh, and they start to see what way you're doing it, you know, um a lot of them will realize that this is the way forward you know um and as i said a lot of a lot of coaches are going with the game based anyway in ireland at this moment that you know if you listen to the webinar it's game based after game base so it's just as i say adding that next layer to that game based coaching and progress it that way um you know if you have a strength and conditioning coach that's where maybe you know you have to get them on board because they're they're the ones who can be very um you know they could have their methodology as very traditional in in terms of strength and conditioning, and that that's where you might have to um, really sell it to them and, and and get them on board too. So you know it's it, it's it's um yes, yeah, it's, it's just about again opening their minds and uh, and giving them a look at the philosophy and trying to sell it to them and teach them. Who's having that conversation, and that's where like again you learn as well from from different. Uh, coaches management but look you'll not have that problem congratulations on uh, being ratified uh, I believe it was yesterday wasn't it Donegal yeah, ratified yeah, yeah. yeah yesterday um, I suppose last year we didn't really um, we just there's so much going with Covid mm -hmm. and that we just kind of decided to reapply and see how we got on and lucky enough we were um, ratified so yeah, look, as Stephen said, it's it's educating and moving on and, and things like that there. And what well, the one thing I like about it is we are in a game-based model now. We're largely in our, in our in terms of the So it's it's just you know if 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 you put it really um, in a real simple manner, it's creating the why we're doing the games that we're doing. Mm -hmm. Like we're doing the games now, we're adding the why, and that's you know to me that that that's very simple and that's interesting. You know, we talk about um, managers and coaches there because like if you look at it. Um, you know, the real challenge I think for coaches is if you're working with a manager who wants to play a certain way, then, you know, isn't it a great chance to develop a game model and, and you know, from their beliefs to their philosophies that you have to coach the team as well. And that'll add so much imagination to you. And like that'll, that'll really challenge coaches, I think, you know, in terms of, of methodology that people are in. So that would be, you know, like I know Colin Nally spoke about that before. Like somebody asked him, could you work with a manager who doesn't, you know, see the game as you? Well, you, like the ultimate challenge for a coach then would be right. I'll build a game model and I'll figure it out from what you're telling me. And you know, so either that or you throw the bed at training one night and then <laughs> <laughs> you storm off. Um, Sam, uh, final final part just with um, the quality of coaching that 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 comes across for me. Um, looking at it on throughout the years. To me, it looks like as if the coaches, there's coaches that can run training sessions, but actually can't coach game plans, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, I do. I, and, and I think, you know, sort of expanding on, uh, you know, both of the lads' points there, there's, the, for me, the big problem in coaching is that there's so much, you know, bias in, in terms of what you believe is right. Uh, tradition over here in, you know, England, uh, you know, football coaching, tradition's a big problem. Culture's a big problem. Uh, you know, people thinking, you know, we know what the game is because we invented it. Well, you know, we don't anymore because we've not won a World Cup since 1966. And, and that's a massive problem I find with coaches. You've got to, you know, recognise that research is coming in all the time. You know, like Stephen said, this is there's a lot of science behind this. You know, it's proven. It's not someone's philosophy. You know, well, this sounds all right. Let's have a go. There's research, years and years of research behind it. And, you know, I, you know, I'm in a coach education role now at Leeds Beckett. What I always say to, uh, you know, a lot of the students is, you know, you can have a philosophy, you know, you can have your way of thinking, but don't ever, you know, oppose new ideas because research is always coming in. It's always coming in, you know, new ideas, new concepts, you know, and if you're stuck in your ways, I think that's where you kind of get left behind. You know, if you're a coach that, yeah, I know what my philosophy is. I know what uh, what I'm doing here, my methodology. 
but you're still open to learning and developing and new ideas coming in, I think that's where you get there. So, you know, for me, coaches listen to this, you know, even if this challenges, you know, like, like we've spoken about of, you know, working under a manager that, you know, that's a load of rubbish. I've been a coach for 30 years. You know, that, that's certainly something I've faced as well with this. It's just little steps, little steps, just trying to, you know, yeah, but, you know, have you read this? Have you got that? Try and change the, you know, sort of perception or stuck in the ways, if you like. But, you know, we're always learning, aren't we? You know, it was one of the things one of my uh, lecturers said to me when I was in my first year at university, don't ever think you know everything because you're always learning, you're always developing, you know, and even on here tonight, I've, I've learned loads. So that would always be my my message to uh, to any coaches listening. No, definitely. And um, I suppose whenever they say, whenever you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. So I can definitely, I can definitely say that. That's definitely not the case for me tonight. But boys, like it was... As I say, I could talk to for you for hours about this. Um, Stephen, with uh, the tactical periodization, then, um, do you know, will more inter county teams use it? Do you think as well, or are they using it? What stage are we in? It seems it seems to me that it's still in its infancy. Yeah, I think the top coaches are, are a lot of them are using it. You look at, um, say, Keen O'Neill. Uh, I know Keane, he, he's using it. Um, I think I've heard Donnie Buckley uses it. Um, uh, Luke has mentioned a few coaches there. He, he's heard use it. So I think I think the top ones um, are using it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, they mightn't call it tactical periodization, yeah. but they're using, it is it is tactical, <laughs> you know, that they're using, they've, they've learned it themselves or they've learned. Um, so, I think that I think the top coaches are using it, and generally, when the top coaches are doing something, generally filters down after a couple of years to the grassroots. Um, but there hasn't been much uh, kind of uh, things like this where it's been discussed uh, on G, uh, towards GAA. Yeah. Um, and once once more more the top coaches uh, uh, open up a bit more about it. Um, I think it'll come on stream, but um, you look at you look at the Premiership there, um, the amount of coaches in the Premiership using it. Like uh, Pep Liner is at Liverpool. He's um, he's a kind of disciple of uh, Victor Frada too. You know, he worked over in Porto with Victor Frada. So Liverpool are using it. You know, Brendan Rodgers using a Leicester. Um, so it, it is the go-to in the Premiership, and you know, their methodologies. They, they come back in, over into GA eventually too so you know we're a little bit slower in terms of receiving some of that that information but I think I think it's um, I think it's on its way No it's, it's, it's brilliant look I suppose like you know whenever you've come against um, I suppose you've been to many training sessions across Ulster and that and, and the workshops as well as myself um, do you know there is room for, for maybe this to be be started yeah, and it's just I suppose as the men, as the two men alluded to there, it's it's about educating. You know, like we are doing a lot of it. Like if we look at, if we look at probably the most, I know it's it's kind of controversial because you're not going to get a games in Dublin or the, the you know obviously the, the team to beat with the but if you look at say Harlan for example, like Paul Canark is you know probably the the most innovative coach in Ireland, and you know he's using it. Like that, 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 that's the reality. So if we, you know, and, but the biggest problem I would have, John, is, is, is like I said, we're a closed book, you know, we're not, a, and, the, um, the, you know, one of the biggest problems I'd have as well is you'd have, you, you're trying to educate people and then people who don't uh, maybe agree with it or think it's worthwhile, then they shoot it down straight away. So I suppose that it's about educating as well. And I suppose it's about mentioning as well that, this is our philosophy or this is the way we want to coach or, and the top coaches are doing it. If that's not what you want to do, then that's that's okay. You might want to take one element of it and practice it and realise this works and then build from there. But if, if we could um, incorporate things like that there into, you know, our coach education system where, you know, you're emphasising. And the biggest lesson for me was tying it all together under the tactical umbrella, you know, you know, this isolation of, you know, your social as one, your technical as one, your tactical as another. It's not, it's all tied into one. And, you know, Sam gives some great examples of that as well. So mm-hmm. if we can educate that, that, you know, we're trying to get, create game moments and training all the time, then 
that's logic. That in its most simplest, like in the most simple way, like we're trying to create as many game moments in training and and work towards our principles of them game moments. So I think there's a massive opportunity there if we can open the door to you know coaches coming on and, and maybe explain this stuff and and working and developing workshops. Um, I think we'll definitely see it over the next couple of years. Because whenever I was invited to do a couple of sessions with with underage teams or different clubs and out there. And I messed him saying, well, what do you want me to work on? Uh, anything at all. You know, it doesn't, do you know what I mean? So like, it's still even like, don't, don't, like, I says, well, what stage are you at or what? Uh, if you do a bit of running or not, the fittest team or whatever, like, you know what I mean? So it's still so, that's what I'm saying. People have to, like, there is so much research, not in the GA, as we said, you know, whenever I was looking up, um, as I said, just to nail tactical periodization and what it meant, you know, Sam was a standout, even even across the water, Sam. Do you know what I mean? There's still not even that that um, literature or, or uh, talking about it. Um, like, the one thing for me is, uh, like, I like, you know, I'm a big NFL fan, big football fan as well. I like taking elements from, from different sports and that. And the big thing for me is Bielsa, and his murder ball, um, is is Bielsa tactical periodization, or is he on a different planet to everyone else, and we're just living here? <laughs> no, I I think he definitely has the, the elements. You know, he might not say it's tactical periodization, but the sort of fundamental principles are there because, you know, if if you listen to them Leeds players, you know, when he first came in, they were like, you know what on earth is this? We've, we've, we've never seen anything like this. High intensity, made the ball, you know, crazy intensity, but it blitz the game. So, you know, still the, the fundamental concept, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Stephen, have you ever brought in murder ball into, into one of your sessions? On... Yeah, I did actually, yeah. <laughs> um, it's, uh, yeah, it, as I say, you get, the, you get the high intensity and you, you know what I mean? It's, it's a good one. To get that fitness, um, yeah, you know, you know, boys feeling really out on their feet and that kind of element uh, through using the game. Um, so particularly when you're we're, we're between lockdowns and everything and trying to play a championship, we trying to hit hit everything into one session. Uh, that was as good a game now to to use. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose I guess that is it. We're going to draw the close there, boys. But I suppose it is having faith in yourself as well. You know, whenever you're you're trying to plan a session and you're throwing in absolutely everything, you're afraid that you've missed something. And I suppose it's just having that courage and conviction in, in what you've yearly plan or six month plan, whatever you do. Um, so I'm just on a, on a final note. How far do you plan ahead, and how much time do you give? your opponents then do you know or what you haven't done particularly well in a match as well yeah i mean great question to finish uh how far do i plan ahead probably about two years which you know a lot of people say well that's absolute madness because you're in you really amateur context but for me that's 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 plan like we said before with the spiral curriculum so you know you've got your game model how long is it going to take you to get through that initial phase of the game model then what's the next stage and what like in the next stage and the next stage and i always work out well, how long is it going to take my players to get to that stage for five versions of this game model? Right. That's probably going to take two years then. So, that, so that, that's the furthest I go. Uh, re- re- really great question as well when you're balancing that sort of traditional uh, expectation of players about, you know, well, we didn't do very well on that. How do we bring that in? What I did at my last club was we used to train on a Wednesday and on a Saturday. So I said to the players, right, so, so Wednesdays, you know, the game model, what I want to do, tactical periodization. Uh, Saturday, you know, you tell me what your weakness is, what you felt, you know, I'll come up with a session around that. What they didn't know was it was still around tactical periodization. <laughs> so that would be, the, you know, maybe a bit, a bit uh, naughty really adding that in. But, you know, that that was, that, that met their needs, should we yes. say. Give them they, ownership they, as well. They felt, yeah, exactly. They felt, right, he's like, us go away, think about what we want to do suitable for the you know the age the level where they're at uh you know I, I suppose i was ahead of him in terms of making sure it was still aligned to what i believed in and what helped but you know that met that particular culture because it met their expectations and they weren't anyone saying well you know what's kicking off with this kid and, and the sessions he's doing uh 
but yeah, you know, I, I mean, again, context specific, you know, where I'm at now, uh, you know, them, them, those players love it. So we don't need to do any of that. And there's probably a bit more faith of, mm-hmm. you know, we, we really buy into this and we believe what, what Sam's doing. Uh, you know, I, I think it's probably balanced it out to, again, we, we talk about buying for me, that's such an important element of this really. And maybe you want to plan your buying. So, you know, I think like we said before, you don't have to throw this in straight away, throw the kitchen sink at it. <laughs> we can just add little elements here. Yeah. So, you know, that might just be one activity out of that full session. But over time, when the players are saying, oh, yeah, we like this, or this is working for us, then eventually we can get to that full methodology of, you know, making it the Bible, if you like. Everything is, is tactical uh, periodization. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, th- those would be my thoughts, finishing thoughts. Is and, uh, so just with the, it, whenever we're talking here about this being in a seventh you know, being introduced in GA, like exciting times, I suppose, with, the, with the, you being a disciple of T, TP that, you know, this is coming into the sport more and more now. Yeah, it, it's it really is because, you know, again, I'm amateur football. Not nobody's doing what I'm doing. Uh, you know, they all think I'm a nutter. You know, they, they think I'm this. They, they probably think I think I'm in the professional game, and you know what am I doing? Uh, you know, I've I've got nine coaches working with me in an amateur setting. Uh, but for me, it's incredibly exciting because you know, again, studied it for five years. Finally, in a context where I'm the boss, this is what I want to do. We're going to do it. Uh, you know, finally, in a context where players can really see the benefits, really enjoy it. And, you know, we had three sessions before lockdown with uh, the new team, Ilkley. You know, by the end of that third session, those players were just... Yeah, I've never, never seen anything like it. You know, in just terms of decision-making on the pitch, I'm, I'm seeing them make decisions that I've got in my game model. I'm looking at it on my clipboard, you know, physically so fit, communication, you know, confidence... Uh, game awareness it was absolutely incredible so you know really exciting times uh, you know I, I really like you know bringing something different you know that uh, players haven't seen before and I like it when they say you know I've, I've never seen this before but you know I like it it's, it's new I mean that that always you know brings a smile to my face but yeah re- really exciting times and, and I think like you say uh, you know these things take time it's, it's like my dissertation at the minute for the Masters is all about how the senior game affects the junior game this is you know a concept that's filtered down and it will just be the same in GAA, it will be the same in rugby, basketball, handball. It's, it's beginning to filter down now. And I think that's where we're probably looking away from being so sport specific. You know, I know in football for years, it was always, no, just look at football practice. Now I look at, you know, loads of invasion sports, uh, you know, game development model, TGFU. I, I don't know if you've come across it or not, but that, that's the, the element of uh, sampling, game sampling. You know, what, what, what are basketball doing? What's netball doing? What's GAA doing? How can we implement that into football and bring something new in it? And it really works for the players. It it really helps build those uh, tactical understandings of the game, but, but also help, uh, you know, be really effective in those decision-making and actions. Brilliant, brilliant, Sam. Sam, just thanks so much for, for coming on. I'm sure the boys uh, would agree that, you know, it's it's refreshing and, and brilliant to, to get your, your thoughts and insights. You know, uh, whenever I said you were the... Uh, the guru, you didn't disappoint. You know, it's it's, it's brilliant to see, Stephen. You know, thanks so much for 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 coming on. Minor awfully football is in great hands. Um, you know, you talk sense. You know, and it's good that you're you're challenging things as well. That you're not, um, as you say, you know, you don't have to be a slave to this either. Yeah, thanks very much. Really enjoyed the the whole uh, podcast. Yeah, so thanks for having me. No, definitely get you on again, Stephen. Um, you know, talk about you might be on the opposing side whenever we get uh, some traditional manager that wants to run hills <laughs> all the time. <laughs> Look, first show, so that's us done. Um, you know, we were chatting about this, and you know, I think this is this is a vital part of, of getting the message out there for all the different methodologies and all the different experiences the coaches have as well. Yeah, um, thanks a million, man, for for coming on. It's been it's been very insightful. Um, learned loads, and yeah, look, when we spoke about it, John, and I'm I suppose I'm honoured to uh, to co-host with you this series. I think there's so many coaches out there that we can learn from, uh, and that's going to be our aim over the next couple of weeks to get coaches on that that we we can learn from. You know that that are willing to share ideas, and you know no coach is going to come on here and tell us you know that they're 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 in depth secrets. But it's I suppose it's exposing uh, exposing coaches 
all over the country to different ideas, different methodologies, different ways of looking at the game, different ways of um, doing things. And you know, one of the things that I like about this is no one size fits all. So it's going to be it's going to be a, a great series. <laughs> no, and uh, uh, anyway, down football is is traditionally branded. We play open, expansive football, and then you've got the Donegal, the Isle pragmatics just through the hands and also it'll be interesting to see look at if we, if we uh, uh butt heads at some stage you know on the, on our on our um the finer details if I say but man yeah well I think you know if we look at the cha- if we look at the championship last year Donegal played slightly better football than down you know so maybe we'd have to roll <laughs> reverse that now <laughs> I'm not saying nothing about off the football but Stephen's gonna change all that um, <laughs> Thank you so much, Sam. Pleasure. I guess speaking to you again, Stephen. We'll get you on again. Uh, you know, great insight there. Thank you so much. And look, we'll get talking again and and get this. That's the first one of the coaching series, and no better man to start it off. Boys, thank you so much. All the best. Thank you very much.